Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode 102. My name is Mark. Here with me today are the designers and creators of Flick Fleet, uh, and I think one or two other games, Jackson Pope and Paul Wilcox. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Having us. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so I'm super excited to talk about Flick Fleet in particular, I think, because I think dexterity games are awesome. And as I understand it, uh, you all make this handmade, uh, which is fascinating. But before we get into that, I'm curious what both of your backgrounds are in board gaming. How did you get into gaming? Um, and then how did you get into designing and producing games? Well, let me think. I was an only child with very young parents. We started playing a little bit of Dungeons & Dragons together when I was about eight. Uh, board games were always a part of my childhood growing up. Lots of Monopoly, lots of Risk after that. Then as I got older, moved on to all the, you know, every month a Games Workshop brought out a new game. I remember like Chainsaw Warrior, Judge Dread, Starship Troopers, all those great classic titles. So I was very into those. Carried on role playing uh, with friends throughout school. Got into war gaming a bit and miniature painting and collecting. Uh, got out of that when I realized it was a total money pit. <laughs> um, kind of carried on playing the same sort of games. Risk was a, a family stalwart. So I was banned from playing it one Christmas ever again um, after the, after the incident. Um, <laughs> and then I started a family with my wife and saw an advert for Beyond Monopoly, a board games club in York where we live. And I went along and discovered all these modern board games. I remember playing Carcassonne. Settlers of Catan, Power Grid, and another Freedom of Freeze game, Finster Fleur, Fears and Floors, on my first Saturday visit there. And I was just totally hooked. And then a few years later, I, I met this fine gentleman and our friendship began. And we've never looked back. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I feel like everyone at one point enters uh, playing a game that it ends up being a money pit. <laughs> I think yeah, how many times? times? How many times though? <laughs> More That's than true. once. Yeah, yeah. And if it hasn't <laughs> happened yet, it's coming. Yeah, mine was magic. Um, yeah, so I I played a lot of games as a kid. Um, I can remember trying to design my own James Bond game after seeing. I guess it was Moonraker, maybe. Actually, no, it couldn't have been Moonraker. There was there was a scene with submarines in a sort of underground lair, and I thought, oh, that's cool. So I tried to make a game about it. But yeah, I remember gaming as a kid, although my memory's shocking, so I don't really remember childhood much. Then it was role-playing when I was at school, along with uh, Games Workshop. So my, I was more on the, um, the Warhammer Fantasy Battle side. That was the closest I got to proper war gaming. Um, then I got into Magic, um, which was, I guess, university. And then I briefly lived in the States and then got into designing games after a game, we played a game of Mighty Empires, which is like the um, it's the setting for Warhammer Fantasy Battle. It's a board game. The idea is you can play it as a board game. Then every time you have a little fight in miniature, uh, Mighty Empires, you can stop and set up a Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Like the game of Mighty Empires we played, just rolling dice to see who won the battles lasted 36 hours over a weekend. And it's like, this is ridiculous. I can't give up that much time to a single game. So I'm sure I can design a game that is, feels a bit like that, but you can play it in like an hour or an hour and a half. This was before I had kids, but I thought an hour and a half was a short game. And then, yeah, so I started designing a game called Border Reavers and moved to York, decided to publish it um, by hand and took it, went to Beyond Monopoly and said, look, I've got this game. I'd like to do some play testing. So bunch of people came along from the club to try it out one of whom was Paul and Paul brought a few of his friends and most of them ordered a copy of the game and uh, I've never looked back well I have looked back but then I look forward again <laughs> incorrigible so uh, I ran a board game publishing company from 2006 to 2011 it went really badly I sold lots of games but didn't make any money um, and they said right never again that's me done and then, like, I think it was three months later, well, that's a good idea for a board game. And promptly started designing again and then started this second company in 2017. And Paul joined in 2018 to make Flip Fleet, which we've been doing pretty much nonstop since. So it's getting on for five years old now. Yeah. So it, it, with Flick Fleet, whose who's idea was that initially? 
yeah, Oof. kind of kind of mine. We um, like Jack said, he used to live in York, and then for work reasons, he and his family moved up to Newcastle. And um, our families are friends, so we we get together a few times a year. And we we slept up to Newcastle, which is about what two two and a half hour drive away. And Jack and I had stayed up late on the Friday evening playing games. And on the Saturday, our families all got together to go for a walk around a, a lovely country house estate. And um, in an effort to ignore our children, Jack and I spent three hours having a conversation about board games. At some point, I said, following the previous night's shenanigans, someone should make a game where you flick spaceships around and launch dice off the back of them as weapon systems. And that was that. And then, then over the next three hours, Flick Fleet was born. And the amazing thing is that from that conversation, it didn't actually alter very much. Um, just talking, you know, shooting ideas backwards and forwards and having firm ideas of what we wanted it to be, it kind of took shape really, really quickly. It was quite surprising. And we did get in trouble for ignoring our families as well. And I believe they got covered in mud in a rhododendron garden and we were oblivious to it. And so highly yeah. plausible. <laughs> so tell me more about uh how flick fleet works other than what you just said or is that pretty much that's pretty much that, basically <laughs> no be fair there's a bit more to it um yeah i mean the, the key the name is the clue yeah but the, the the key elements are you you have a small fleet of acrylic spaceships the imperium of earth and the uprising which may sound very familiar you take it in turns to activate a ship you flick them to move them and you do put d6s and d10s on them to represent different weapon systems and you flick them to shoot your opponent ships if they the die hit but goes out of the play area it is a miss if ships leave the play area they fled the battle however there is a little bit more going on because each of the ships has a dashboard uh, which has wooden cubes and discs on it these represent the systems on that particular ship that are currently operable and the discs represent that that, sh that that thing is available for an action each turn. Each ship will have two actions. Um, I've just realised you can tell I spent all weekend at the UK Games Expo explaining <laughs> this. But as the ship gets damaged, those discs get removed. And one of the two actions you could take might be to repair a system. Uh, the ships also have a little white cubes that represent shields. These absorb the damage to start with. But as they come off, then the systems get damaged. And it's it, it's interesting because it starts off, you think that's so silly and simple. But when you play, the tactical decision-making space actually gets quite complex because you only have two actions and they have to be different actions. And the range of things each ship can do varies considerably. Some can launch fighter and bomber wings, for example, as long as their fighter and bomber bays still have a disc on them and haven't been hit. So it's, yeah, there's, a, there's the timing of what you do when and the order in which you do it, but also you can't do everything that you need to do all the time. So it's an interesting tactical process to decide what to do. And it is ridiculously good fun as well because you're flicking, you know, little acrylic say, spaceships yeah, yeah, around yeah. And, and flicking dice, um, which is just ridiculously fun. It's just the thing I'm proudest of, I think, is from that conversation we outlined how we wanted the game to be for us it was exactly the game we wanted to play and that is the game we have created and luckily a number of other people seem to want to play that game as well is that fair jack yeah spot on um basically flick ships flick dice <laughs> work out where, how you're going to spend your two turns and um and like paul says it's it's all about the, the timing of actions because you've only got each ship is going to activate once per turn uh, and you, but you choose which order they activate in. Each ship only gets two actions each turn. Is it? Do you want to repair your shields? Do you want to repair a system? Launch fighters, shoot, run away. Um, all those decisions are available to you, and you've just got to pick two. And that's that's where the fun comes in. Plus, of course, if you've ever tried to flick a D10 off the top of a plastic ship at another plastic ship, you'll find they don't go in the straightest of lines. I was going to say, there's, there's something to the different shape of the the dice, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we were, as Paul said, we spent most of last weekend just playing Flick Fleet endlessly at the UK Games Expo with a crowd of people gathered around ooing and ahhing because the die goes straight at the ship it's going at and then goes round it somehow and then completely skirts it or goes through the middle and it's just crazy things happen. So, yeah, lots of fun. Yeah, that's the thing with dexterity games that's great is that 
no matter how serious you make the game, there's at least one aspect that's going to be incredibly goofy. Yeah. <laughs> it has to be. Uh, I remember I was playing once this, proto- this dexterity prototype uh, that was about card stacking or like, you know, constructing things with cards. And we're playing it really serious because you had to be very careful with how you place the cards and how you created the structure. And we're at the key point of the game. And I just laid a card down very precisely. It was a difficult maneuver. And I was on my way to winning the game. And I finished it. And in a moment of relief, exhaled <laughs> and blew the entire <laughs> thing over. <laughs> I think I think I've had that experience with uh, Rhino Hero. Rhino Hero, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah, yeah. Interestingly, some of our discussions in that initial three hours were kind of summarizing our experiences of dexterity games because we're both huge dexterity game fans. But talking about it, we realized often there's something a little dissatisfying about them. Often the the dexterity element itself can feel like a gimmick rather than being thematically integral. You know, what what is your agency in this? Mm -hmm. And often the games just last too long for what they are. So again, that reinforces it's a toy with a gimmick rather than the game. So we wanted to create a game that was short and brief and to the point, but was fun. And we found a lot of dexterity games, the fun wears thin because you're mechanistically doing the dexterity thing over and over and over again. So that was kind of our integral uh, design brief. Keep it fun, keep keep it short. And we managed it, I think. So we're really pleased with that. It was a good exercise working out why it is we like some games more than others or what it is about them we like. So it was, it was good. And that's uh, the nature of our friendship. We challenge each other about games. <laughs> and do you remember any of those examples you talked through of or what you identified as being the problem areas more specifically. Yeah, I mean, one for me, and I, I don't like bad-mouthing games, um, but I love Pitch Car, but I think it can... I mean, everyone's going to house rule it to make it shorter because, you know, doing three laps can be an hour plus. And I mean, I'm, I'm sure Jack remembers someone got the bright idea at Beyond Monopoly that everyone who owned a copy of Pitch Car should bring it in and we make one massive track. And I think it took what an hour and a half to do a lap, if I remember correctly. And it it was fun because it was an event, but the actual playing of the game actually, you know, it, it wasn't as fun as when you're just playing on a, a small track. Um, so that that was an issue. And the night before our conversation, we'd actually played Flick 'em Up, which again was really good fun, very very clever, well designed, beautifully manufactured. At least the original wooden version but felt like it went on too long for what it was. Um, so, I mean, that directly fed into that discussion because we'd enjoyed it, but I think we both felt a little bit disappointed with it and we were trying to work out why. Probably not helped by alcohol and us finishing at like half one in the morning, I think. <laughs> People with memories terrifying. I had no memory of this game whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> you absolutely destroyed me at it. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah, I managed to shoot oh. cac- cactus after cactus rather than your cowboys. Yeah, one interesting thing with dexterity games for me is that for almost maybe every dexterity game I can think of, it's sometimes more fun to fail, right? There's And it's about the possibility of failure. And I'm curious if that's something you all thought of when you were designing this of, you know, obviously you want to hit the ship if you shoot at it. But yeah. can you still make the game fun and entertaining when that, you know, the die is going right at it and bounces off, you know, in, in, in a skew? Yeah. Way. So, yeah, one of the things, to, like one of the key things of Flick Fleet is that you don't want to leave the player. So we normally play on like a three foot square mat. Um, and if the ship leaves the play area, it's run away. So when you flick your ship, you flick it gently because you don't want it to go out of play. When the when you flick a die, if the die hits something but then goes out of play, it does no damage. So you want to flick the die softly. So everything is gentle flicking, which almost inevitably leads to the I'm going right at the ship I want to hit and I stop about half an inch short of where I need to be. It's like, no! And one of the things that really stood out at the expo was that we were playing two-player games pretty much solidly for three days, and we often had a crowd, and the crowd was making just as much noise as the players. The groans, the cheers, it sort of really brought it home. 
it's a surprisingly good spectator sport. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm not, I'm not sure. Failures. Yeah. The funny failures. Yeah, I'm not sure we thought about kind of not hitting with the dice when we designed it, but when we, I remember the first time we played it and we realised, you know, the, the shapes of the polyhedral dice themselves mean, you know, that's where the, the randomness of, of the game comes in, that, you know, it's not all, you can't plan it perfectly. You know, physics will still get you. And that felt from the start like a really satisfying balance of skill versus look. Um and we wanted it to be like there is there is skill and there is a le- evolution of skill. There's been a thread on Board Game Geek recently about you know that the D6 is too powerful because you can flick it off the top of the ship and it will always land the right way up. And I, I'm thinking I I can't do that. <laughs> and I've yeah. played flick fleet thousands and thousands of times, but I can't do it that. But clearly, some people can. And that skill, I think, you know, if you've got it, great, use it. But then I bet you can't do it with the D10. Um, so yeah, so it's kind of that, that balancing thing. And what I found, this may sound stupid, but I haven't actually watched other people play the game very much until the UK games expo. When we have played with the people, it's usually been quite intensively to play test new ideas and new ships. So just standing back and watching other people play, it was an absolute revelation because like Jack said, the spectator sport element of it was fantastic. You know, the noises people were making, the body language, people were invested in it because things went wrong. Um, and sometimes things went amazingly well, and that was just as amazing. So it was, it was really satisfying. But I don't think we could have designed that level of kind of the, the skill evolution into it right from the start, because I don't think we thought about that element immediately. And we've been at it for a while now, so the, the first yeah. sprint run went to Kickstarter in 2018 and I think we were shipping them in 20, early 2019. Yeah. Um, and we've been back three times for three new expansions. Um, so there's been lots of extra content over the years. Yeah, which has all been awesome. Yeah, let's talk about that in the production. So as I understand it, you said you, you hand make all of the copies and you've been primarily doing it through crowdfunding? Yeah. So, so we've been to Kickstarter four times. The first one had a twelve thousand pound target because the the spaceships are made from five mil, which is what I guess about a quarter of an inch thick acrylic. Um, and Paul laser cuts them in his garage on a laser cutter. And so the first Kickstarter campaign was to buy a laser cutter, to buy all the stuff to make a number of games and to pay for the shipping. And so we set a target of twelve thousand pounds. Uh, did a 30-day campaign. We funded with four hours to spare, not in the four hours, uh, and got 101% funded. Um, and then 2% of people's cards got declined. And so we actually ended up with 99% of our targets. Um, so that was an excruciating month. Um, but then we went back the following year, had a smaller target because we didn't need another laser cutter. Humorous story. We did later need a new laser cutter. And so that one funded in three and a half days and raised 13,000 pounds. And then we did two little ones during COVID because we couldn't get together to play test the thing that we're working on now, which is multiplayer flippy. Because up until now, it's been a two-player game. And yeah, so we did a tiny little one and we, we were literally sat there on the morning in Lord saying, 500 pounds, are we going to hit that? We're going to look like right idiots if we don't hit 500 pounds. And so we did that and it funded in an hour and raised 19,000 pounds. And then we did another one a year later and said, right, well, that was clearly taking the mix. So what we'll do is a thousand pounds. And that ended up with funded in seven minutes and raised 32,000 pounds. So um, it's been it's been growing steadily over the, the campaigns. But yeah, the, the first print run, so Paul does all the laser cutting in his garage. He does all the bagging and um, collecting. Sorting all the wooden bits and, and everything. Yeah. Uh, the first print run, I made all the boxes by hand from flat bits of greyboard and stickers. Um, we soon realised that was unsustainable because I have a full-time job in a young family and each box took 20-something minutes to make. Uh, we had 400 of them to do. So it started out by me doing them all and Paul started helping me and then we decided never again. <laughs> and uh, since then, we've been buying boxes. And, but Paul's still doing the laser cutting in his garage which is hard work that the game comes essentially in two flavors standard and deluxe 
Um, standard is laser cut, deluxe is laser cut and has laser etched details on like ship names and a little bit of um, kind of, you know, flavor detail. Um, but they take three times as long to make, which when you stood in your garage for all hours doing it, feels like a very long time. <laughs> Plus it's a lot more sorting involved because in the standard version, you just put four of these in the box, whereas in the deluxe version, you've got to put them right four with the right four names in the box. Yeah, yeah. I think as far as I'm aware, I've got it wrong twice, which given we've just sold, I think, a thousand copies, I'm not unhappy about. Two yeah. out of a thousand, I can live with that. <laughs> Plus, of course, there's the, we've done about a thousand expansions as well. That's true. Yeah, two thousand, yeah. two in two thousand. That's that's good. Good odds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, what led to the decision to hand make it all instead of finding you know a manufacturer elsewhere to to do it? <laughs> so, one I've got previous. Um, so, my first board game publishing company. The first two games I did were hand made small runs. So, I did a hundred copies of Border Reavers and then 300 copies of it's live. And this new company started, in fact, with another handmade run of a game called Zombology, which was 200 copies. Um, but because these ships are, are fairly complex shapes and made out of acrylic, there's essentially two ways you can do it. You can laser cut them, which you either pay someone to do, and we couldn't afford to sell the games, or we do it ourselves. Um, or you injection mold them. But because, you, because of the, the number of molds we re- require, the minimum print run to make that viable would be like two and a half thousand copies. Um, at which point, I really don't want to be sat on two and a half thousand copies in every room in the house and able to sell them. So, doing it ourselves allowed us to go with a, a print run of 400 copies, which is small enough that I was fairly com- confident we could get rid of them. Um, and in fact, we did. And then with the second campaign, we made, made another 400 copies and we sold all of those. And with the fourth, Kickstarter, we did another bit that, and we're just over halfway through that one, I think, Paul, is that right? Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it was a, a decision born of, I guess, necessity, really, because we realised that the, you know, there just wasn't a margin for anyone to make any profit out of it any other way. And also, we kind of like making things huh. and having full control over all the processes involved and the quality controlling that says something about us as people i'm sure but you know we we would feel somewhat uncomfortable relinquishing that to someone else even on a contractual basis um we like doing it hmm. um i mean but the, the 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 process is involved there's there's lots of them it's um, and certainly you know luckily my family are very indulgent and don't mind our upstairs landing having stacks of flick fleet boxes on it and uh, guest bedroom being, you know, basically a storeroom for ship dashboards and wooden cubes and discs and things. But, uh, you know, we're lucky that we can actually physically fit it all in somewhere. But making the boxes ourselves was utterly insane. I don't know what we were thinking. Um, that's ridiculous. But, yeah, and like I said, we we the game has been and is available through our website along with the expansions. But other than a few board game stores that we have a personal relationship with in the north of England, it is all through our website and the the crowdfunding. Um, and we've done, I think, just said like three expansions, all of which had new ships and new other elements to it as well. The one that fascinates me is asteroids from expansion one. That people just keep buying more asteroids. <laughs> um they they act as a, a barrier or a shield or a kind of a thing that fragments and can become a weapon effectively in the game but i think the record was someone ordered eight sets i think it was is now done is that many that. yeah but we've, we've yeah we, we have a lot um, but i remember when we started making them i hated them because of the you can hear the laser head moving on its path and up to that point everything it had done was fairly regular but it kind of hit this weird whine with it making an irregular shape and it just set my teeth on edge the first couple of weeks I was making them. Now I'm just like, yeah, that's just, I can tell exactly where it is in the process from the noise it makes, um, which is again, says something about me as a person, I think, but yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting how, <laughs> how quickly you adapt to things, but, but the expansions are great. And um, we're very proud of the last one, Box of Flicks 2 because that was actually, we kind of put out a call to fans of the game and said, have you got any cool ideas for stuff you'd like to play with? And kind of, you know, they, they sent us their ideas and we, we sifted through them and kind of thought, well, yeah, I want to do that too. That sounds really cool. Let's go with that. 
And we ended up uh, paying them for their ideas and working with them to refine them and develop them and then, you know, put their names on the box as well as ours. And it was so invigorating because it was ideas that we just would not have thought of ourselves, things like the hyperspace kraken tentacle and um, gaseous nebula and railgun cruisers and just all these things that, you know, we just it just wouldn't have occurred to us to do. So it was really, really satisfying. And I remember when we were playtesting the first expansion, we had an afternoon because we knew we wanted to have a mine laying ship that seeded the board with like exploding space mines. But all the ideas we'd had of how to do it just felt clunky and mechanistic when they were in play. And then we suddenly hit on something and it just worked. And it was like, that's that's exactly what we wanted it to be. It was perfect. And I remember looking up at Jack in my living room and saying, this is more than the game now. It's a system. <laughs> and it really felt like with Box of Flicks too, that, that really meant something because other people had taken our ideas and kind of the, the parameters of the game and, and just done new stuff with it. And it was so satisfying. And we got to introduce Pink Acrylic to the game, which made me, for some reason, very happy. I've just, been, just had an email today, in fact, from somebody who's just bought the game, who just bought the PMP for us to either laser cut or 3D print their own ships, saying, uh, where can I send my alien ideas? <laughs> <laughs> but we did have a slight setback that I accidentally managed to set the laser cutter on fire last autumn and destroy it, which apart from... Another smoke, laser cutter. Yeah, apart from smoke damage, there was, there was no lasting harm done. Um, but it meant we hadn't finished all the products for the backers. So we had to go out and say, I'm really sorry, there's going to be a delay. And it ended up taking, what, six months before we got back? It was speed again? three, I think. Oh, was I suppose, it, that, yeah, once, yeah, once it was all, yeah. yeah. Three months for the laser cutter to arrive. The, and then a bit longer to actually get everything up to speed and then finished, um, which was, you know, wiped out a fair chunk of our profit and was quite soul-destroying. Plus, I, you know, it's a big mistake to make. But I've met lots of people since who run businesses of laser cutters, and they're like, oh, I've destroyed three. Don't worry about it. It's one of those things. And I'm like, oh, God, no, not again. But that, you know, is just part of the learning process. Mm-hmm. Um, so so now we're all hands on deck ready for the, the next iteration of Flick Fleet, uh, Flick Fleet Xeno Wars, which, as Jack alluded to earlier, raises it from a two-player game to an up to four-player game. And actually five if you have Box of Flicks 2 and it's fan-designed Space Pirates faction who are blue acrylic ships. So that's been an interesting journey. It was something we wanted to do for ages, but because of the pandemic, we just, like Jack said, we didn't get enough chance to get together enough until recently, really. Uh, but it's come together satisfyingly quickly now, I think. Good. And yeah. we're on, yeah. the, on the home stretch. <laughs> yeah, and it strikes me that this uh, entire game is really, you know, when, when it comes to, to Kickstarter and crowdfunding, you know, a lot of what you hear about in board gaming is basically people using that as a pre-order system for a game they already know is going to sell. But with, with Flick Fleet, it's very much in the spirit of, you know, why Kickstarter was made in the first place, which was to try to get people who just had an idea, you know, access to some money so they can make that idea. And I, I think that's really cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, that first campaign, we we had like a thousand pounds in the company of our own money and that was it we had no marketing budget we didn't spend any money on ads or anything probably why it only just funded at the last possible minute but um yeah i mean it's it's been absolutely without it we we wouldn't have been able to make things to talk no chance. and all of that came to us thanks to the four kickstarter campaigns so we're a little on edge at the moment because for ethical reasons we're moving from kickstarter to gamefound and obviously, as a, as a crowdfunding platform, that's only recently started working with smaller publishers. So we're a, we're a bit on edge because it, it is, on the face of it, it looks the same and works the same. But actually, when you lift the hood, it, it's a little bit different. Um, and I think expectations and how it draws back as in is different. And we're just not sure how that's going to go. We're hoping we have a, a critical mass of friends and followers who will hopefully mean we fund but it's the degree beyond that we go that's kind of causing us some trepidation and therefore how much do we invest in kind of the stretch goals and the add-ons and you know the the bigger elements of the campaign Uh, of course the costs of everything have just gone up thanks to a 
war in Ukraine and the knock-on cost of living crisis that's caused. So yeah. exciting times. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. In terms of like, from your perspective, what are those big changes between Kickstarter and GameFound or differences? Probably the thing that, that annoys me the most at the moment is that as a creator, you don't get an email telling you when you get comments. Oh. So, comment, so people can add comments and you've got no idea. You've just got to trawl through all the updates and the comments page to see if anyone said anything since you last looked, which is a bit of a pain. It's, it's treat stretch goals and add-ons in a much better fashion. It doesn't have an app. And so it's, it's only the website, which means that people who would have trawled through the Kickstarter app looking for things to fund wouldn't be doing that. They, they might be on the game time page, but it's not quite as easy. Um, and I guess one of the, the biggest other things is I've no idea. I mean, Kickstarter claims, I mean, if you look back through our campaigns, which are obviously all available, Kickstarter claims it's brought in like 35 to 45% of our backers. Um, I'm not sure how true that is. I think some of those will have come from the ads that we've run and been attributed to Kickstarter. But of course, that doesn't exist on game kind. So... <laughs> I, I don't know if we're going to lose forty five percent of our backers because that, yeah. that functionality isn't really there yet. So I don't know. Exciting times. And I spent a few days kind of going through GameFound campaigns and comparing them with Kickstarter campaigns. And one of the the issues I have with it is that <laughs> I don't know how to put this politely. My perception was that GameFound backers generally expect bigger what I would regard as more bloated projects, whereas a lot of Kickstarter backers seem a bit more cash aware, wanting value for money. And as you said, the original idea of helping people create their dreams, that still is there a bit on Kickstarter. On GameFound, I think it's much more about big products. Uh, I, I'm hoping I'm wrong because obviously Flick Fleet is, well, I guess we are. We have become quite a big product if you buy everything all at once, but in essence, it's a small box game. So that just worries me a little bit that we might get drowned out by big campaigns or that people won't back because they're looking for the, the super mega deluxe level that we just don't have. Um, so they're, they're the things that are concerning me a little bit. And that it is, from our point of view as manufacturers and publishers, a little bit of an untested arena. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the first tranche of small publishers have just recently finished their campaigns, and I don't think any of them did staggeringly well. I think they funded, but I'm trying to have had conversations with one in particular and are trying to learn lessons from where they think they went wrong. But it's just such a new thing for us to do that we're a little bit on edge about it. Because mm-hmm. they, they ran a few, they ran a beta for like six months or nine months mm-hmm. or something, and the only campaigns during that were all like massive ones for massive games that raised like a million dollars or one and a half million euro or 900,000. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we're not in that deep. When, no, that order of magnitude. Um, we're, in fact, we're probably two orders of magnitude at least below that. <laughs> so the first, like Paul says, the first tranche of small indies have just started. They've just either are now running or have just started finishing it. It's interesting to yeah. see how, how they cope on the new platform. And I was going to say, if you imagine, I'm not saying it's a, you know, it's not a zero sum game, but people will have a budget, and you know, are you going to spend, you know, two hundred and fifty dollars to support for small publishers when you can get the the all singing, all dancing requires its own room, Castles of Burgundy, for example, you know, which looks gorgeous. I'm not going to knock it. I have the first cardboard edition. I'm very happy with that, but it it does look absolutely stunning. But you know, I think there are issues for me personally about. Yeah the deluxification of the hobby and and just the amount of plastic that's getting churned into it as well um but you know that's says the guy laser cutting acrylic in his garage (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's the thing right you know it's it's been a topic of discussion lately on social media you know when you pose the question do you want to support four small games or one very large one to me the obvious answer is well the four small ones but it doesn't seem like that's a common, or I don't know, overall, right? Like overall, mm. you know, the games that sell the most, what's the game that's been sold the most recently, like in the last few years? Wingspan, which, you know, isn't a fancy game, but it's not 
$150, it's what, $50, $60. Yeah. So I don't know how, what it's like overall, but there's, I think there's definitely people who really, really want to get the big fancy games as just to have the big fancy game. And yeah, I don't know. It's, it's so unusual to me. The bigger and more pieces and more plastic to me, that's like, well, now I'm just going to spend more time setting it up and putting it away rather than playing it. Uh, Mm. Like behind my my curtain here, I have Sleeping God set up on the table and it's been there for a week and a half because I don't want to put it away. (laughs) It's just staying on the table. And I, I, I don't envy your position of, you know, having a slightly more modest game, you know, handcrafted game, a smaller, smaller expectations to try to find uh, you know, your market. Mm. And I think, I remember when I came on board with Jack, I mean, Jack brought me on really as a way to make Flick Fleet work um, as, a, as a product because we, you know, one person couldn't do it. But we, our initial discussions were about us running a company together and how that should work. And we, the three rules were we need to be having fun. It needs to not damage our friendship. And ideally, we'd like it to not cost us any of our own money. Um, I think later on, we realized that we kind of, without speaking of it, agreed certain other things as well. And one of them was we didn't want our backers to ever feel like we were treating them like walking wallets. We we don't like implied exclusivity or uniqueness. And I, I just worry that I think from a marketing point of view, things are kind of heading in that direction more than not. That's you know that's that's what what people want. And when I've pulled, when I've gone to my friends who are you know heavily invested in gaming as a, as a hobby and a lifestyle, and asked them their advice, the things they want are the very things we don't really want to do. And you know ethically, that that creates some dilemmas because do we have to compromise our ethics to stay viable? And I mean we're not anywhere near that point yet, but you know with the shift to game found and everything, I can see it being another conversation we're going to have to have in the future. Um, but every few weeks we do do a reality check and, we, you know, just to ascertain that our friendship is still intact. So that's always very positive. Okay. Um, but, you know, these are challenges you you might not think of when you you, you start off. Yeah. And, and it's a hard thing of running any business is that, you know, the the implied exclusivity or even things that like retail stores do, right, where they where everything's like constantly on sale, even though they've yeah. never added at the original price, you know. We see these things and say, well, that's, you know, that's a little underhanded, but the fact is that it works and it even works yeah. on people who recognize what's happening, right? It's yeah. like an innate Crazy, part of our it? psychology yeah. and I'll catch myself falling for these similar things, uh, yeah. which is, is difficult. So like the, the solution is a lot of vigilance, you know, personally, and then trying to make other people aware of it. Like it, it's a psychological mm. and social solution. But taking advantage of it is very, very easy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, because the industry does have that air of gentrification and deluxification, we we do need to do some things that head in that direction. I mean, one of the, the issues we're floating around with fans at the minute now is a big box to store all the little boxes in. Because after Xeno Wars, if you've been a fan all the way through, you'll now have five Flick Fleet boxes, which is starting to feel a bit cumbersome. And some people have used Plano boxes or similar in addition to those. So we're kind of trying to work with a company to design a, a kind of a fairly deluxe wooden big box. But again, we're, we're still not 100% sure it's the right thing to do because, you know, there's a minimum order we've got to hit. And if we don't, you know, it's thousands of pounds, well, thousands of euros that will be out of pocket if enough people don't want it. Um, and similarly, we've explored like uh, play mats because, you know, a neoprene play mat is a lovely surface to play the game on. Not essential, but it is nice. But our concern there is just their weight and thus the shipping costs. And it's and, such you know, an awkward shape compared to the box. The, the game is like a small box, in fact. <laughs> yeah, whereas obviously a, a mat is usually going to come in like a poster tube. So, yeah, the difference between paying to ship that Versus a what a nearly three foot long meat. tube, yeah, yeah, is you know it's different, and I you think can't really put them in the same package either. No, so. no. But what we keep finding is 
we make things available integral to the game and and people want it but ethically you know we have to be able to look ourselves in the mirror Mm -hmm. and sleep at night and we don't want to treat people like like we said a walking wallet but i'm starting to sense that particularly on game found maybe more than kickstarter that is kind of how some people almost want to be treated and that they want all the super deluxe content they want the biggest the best everything and that you know are we doing ourselves out of longevity by not playing that game i don't know it's it's something we are genuinely morally wrestling with right now because we are you know we're hoping to go live on game found in what exactly three weeks i think yeah. and we've got to make all these decisions pretty quick mm-hmm. um so it's it's difficult and it and you know i don't think we're natural business people that's not why we do this this is a you know someone told me it was a vanity project and i bridled at that but it is a passion project, but it is also a viable product and a very successful game. Like Jack said, we played it with hundreds of people at the UK Games Expo and, you know, the noise was very, very positive. You know, but I found myself saying, look, I know it's expensive, but it is handmade and, you you know, you get a lot of bang for your book kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, You're not buying a box that's 60% air. Um, you know, it's, in fact, the box of Flicks, one box, the lid doesn't quite close properly because there's so much stuff in the box. Love it. Uh, yeah. That's the best. <laughs> it is unless you've got to pack 300 of them. That's, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll give you that. Yeah. <laughs> you have to squeeze every ounce of air out of every little baggie. <laughs> uh, to get the lid on uh, yeah it's a slow process <laughs> but fun yeah and it seems like uh you know as you've gone through all these campaigns and you've actually worked with fans of the game to help design one of the expansions that you've kind of built a community around this game uh that you can consult and rely on what's that process been like process is probably over <laughs> for selling it uh so there has um, there's been a, a surprisingly high number of people who've come back for all four all three of the expansions. So there are definitely people out there who really either are manic collectors or really love the game. And most of the ones I've spoken to have said we love the game. I'm definitely in for the next thing. People started sending us ideas, um, and in fact, even the second the second yeah. expansion. Um, a guy called Matt Yeager in uh, Maryland sent us some ideas. And so some of his ideas made it into the second expansion. And then a lot of his ideas and a few other people's ideas made it into the third. Um, but yeah, it was just people saying, oh, I'd love to do this. But I think this would work really well in the game. And so you look at it and think, yeah, that'd be really cool, actually. I like that too. Yeah. I think because we've always made available print and play files. So if people have a laser cutter or a 3D printer, you know they're they're welcome to make their own stuff, and you know some we did get people asking, can I put up like blank proformers for ship dashboards on Board Game Geek and things like that? And we've always just said yes to everything. You know we want people to be creative and have fun with it in whatever they would, whatever way they want to. But I think the the because of that that kind of openness and kind of inclusivity to it, it's kind of grown that people own it a bit and have a sense of that ownership and that's been really cool to see and i think when we started getting ideas from fans you know a lot of them weren't half baked at all they were you know someone 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 knows our game very very well and as you know there, there were hints people that actually tried this this crazy idea and that was really really satisfying but i think we i think one of the nice things about being a two man outfit and with a game that, you know, like I said, we've sold a thousand copies of the base game, is that I think we can still manage to have that quite personal contact with people. You know, we do try to respond to all the comments on our uh, crowdfunding campaigns. We're aware of the the discussions on Board Game Geek, and we try to chip in and offer advice or our perspective as designers. You know, we try to stay involved in that, which I think if, you know, we had 50 titles out there, we might struggle with. But that's kind of one of the the unexpected pleasures that we can have that kind of personal touch, and I sense that the fans of the game do really like that. Um, so quite a few people came up to us at the expo because th- that was the first time we'd ever exhibited. So uh, the company's like five years old, <laughs> and we've never once exhibited it at a convention. We were hoping to do it in 2019, and we all know how that went. But yeah, people were coming up to us and saying, "I love Flickview. I just wanted to come by and say hi." And 
I think my favourite was uh, near the end of the last day, a dad and his little lad rocked up and uh, he said, I found you. I've been searching all weekend for your store. He said, Oscar, my son here, played this at his cousin's house, loved it, and immediately made his own copy out of folded paper and played for it for hours on the floor. So I just wanted to find you guys and buy a real copy book. It's like, that's awesome. <laughs> So we we literally had tears in our eyes at that point. It was just like this is this is what we we wanted, you know, to hear these stories that people enjoy it and families especially. I think it's it's really really cool because we essentially, like I said, we designed a game we wanted to play, um, and we, and we still enjoy it. I mean, often the times we're playing together is like quite intense play testing, but we still love it and we're still killing ourselves laughing half the time, especially when Jack does something stupid, um, <laughs> which is which is frequent. Um, he likes to point out that almost every time we play, he wins. But we did have, we set up a solo competition for the expo to win a copy of a deluxe copy of everything, and uh, the, the winner of that competition got a score of ten out of fifteen. My high score was eleven out of fifteen. Oh. Paul's high score is six. Wow! I could not. I just could not do it. I just couldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so I think he can, he can take the mick out of me for beating me in two player battles. But um, yeah, 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 I've got the edge in the solo game. Definitely. But yeah, I think because we it, we are you know who we are, making those relationships feel special and important to us. And you know we don't view that as marketing because we're not wired that way. But in effect, it is, and it means people are more inclined to like our products if they like us, uh, or you know give you the benefit of the doubt and try it. And I mean, that, it can sound cynical, but that's not why we do it. You know, we, we like talking to people about our game. Mm-hmm. And we like watching people enjoy our game. So tell me about the future. You mentioned in about three weeks, maybe two and a half by the time this people are actually listening to this podcast, uh, you're going to launch the GameFound campaign for the newest Xeno expansion. Wars. That's yeah, right. Xeno Wars, yeah. Yeah. So it's a it's a standalone expansion. So you can play Xeno Wars. In fact, I have the box right here. Um, Xeno Wars is um, a standalone two player for, for game that introduces two new alien species, the Storm and the Hive. So you can play that just with a box, and it's ready to go. But it, it's also completely compatible with Flick Fleet because it's added two new species to it. You can play Flick Fleet and Xeno Wars to play with up to four people. So the two uh, human factions from the base game and the the two alien species from Xeno Wars. Um, So that's coming to GameFound on the 4th of July. We chose Independence Day because the aliens are coming. (laughs) That was was a genius moment, and I'm afraid that was one pause. Well, it's only because we go on vacation on the 5th, and my mental well-being, I don't think, could handle another, like, the, the constant checking on your phone or your iPad when the companion's live to see, have we funded yet? What are the comments doing? Um, and I decided that this time I kind of am going to bow out of that a little bit. Um, so I was very aware of the dates. And then when we realised that we are nearly ready, the 4th of July just kind of leapt out as uh, I'll be busy packing for my vacation. So that's great. Yeah. But, every, every Sorry, person. Jack. Yeah. Uh, every person I've talked to who has run a crowdfunding campaign is always stressed about the waiting and not the like the work they have to do, uh, which is understandable, but it took me a little off guard. It's, it's just like the anticipation of what are the numbers going to look like. Uh, no, I'm currently stressed at the work I've got to do. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I'm the one that bucks the trend, but then uh, uh, Paul is now employed by the company, so Paul works for the company and gets paid by it. But uh, I have a full time job and young kids, so the any time I get to spend on the company is usually between the hours of half eight and ten pm at night. Um, so I, when Paul said it's three weeks away, I was like, <laughs> I, I can literally count the number of hours I have available to the project between now and then. And there's so much left to do. Yeah, uh, but the good, the good thing is the preview page is live. And I think we've managed to get, what, just over 400 followers so far, which is way right, more right. than what we've done before. So, you know, yeah, it's our promising. previous list was 156. 
Oh, well, that's so, fantastic then. Mm. And the comments fast. are good as well. When you, when you find the comments, they are you know very positive or asking interesting questions. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean the first the first Kickstarter campaign we did, we did it for thirty days because we thought that would give us longer to fund, but it was just too long. It was painful. Um, uh, we were shredded, weren't we? It was. Oh yeah, it was all in, yeah. The most excruciating month of my life. Yeah, that's yeah. what I've heard. Like the you know eighty to ninety percent are always at the beginning and end, anyways. Yeah, is what I've been this, told, and no matter yeah. how if you stretch yeah. it out, it just makes a lo- longer dull period yeah. in yeah. the middle. Uh, our first campaign was 30 days. The second one was 21 days. And the last two were 14 days. So, Which is much better. Tiny, the tiny number. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I can co- cope with that. <laughs> yeah, I'll make sure to put the link for that uh, below. That's very kind. Thank, Thank you. you. Any plans beyond that that you, uh, for Flick Fleet or, or, or the, the company generally, or uh, any designs or anything you are willing to share? So uh, we've already got more ideas than we can actually think of for Flick Fleet. It's one of those things, it's like, you don't want to be the, the guys who do only Flick Fleet, but how about this idea? This is brilliant. Um, so I actually introduced... thought of two new ship ideas whilst I was mowing the lawn yesterday. <laughs> there you um, go. Yeah, I've made notes. So. Does one look like a lawnmower? So, um, <laughs> so we've done two what we call box of flicks which have just added a lot more ship types for the base factions we've just added two new factions but they're quite basic in the in the new expansion there's like a couple of different ship types for each with a few ship a few copies of each so there's a lot of potential to expand those factions with extra ship types um so there might be a box of xeno flicks in the future uh, there was a pirate faction added in the last expansion which again was the opportunity for a box of pirate flicks. See, I, um, I have an idea there because the pirates have a unique ability where they salvage the wreckage of destroyed ships, which was Matt Yeager's idea. It is genius. But I quite like the idea of post Xeno Wars. What if the pirates can salvage bits of alien ships and thus get some different uh, abilities than what they're used to? That that's That's keeping me awake at night in an excited, childish, <laughs> gleeful way at the minute. Um, so those are possible ideas. We've we've got a f- couple of other things we're working on. One I've um, been working at for quite a while is another dexterity game about building a solar system. So you try to collide rocks together to form planets. That one's been hovering at about, I'm going to say, 70% done for a couple of years now. And it's just like, can, can I get it to that 95 or 100% done? And still needs a bit of work, but um, yeah. hopefully. There was a painful point where we thought we were about 98 percent there then we played it with other people and it slid back to about 60 <laughs> 65 percent there but that's life <laughs> yeah yeah and we have a few other ideas that we we periodically work on but obviously one of the downsides of manufacturing a game yourself is that you're manufacturing a game yourself and it's incredibly labor and time intensive so i mean i tend to make notes when i have ideas but i'm ostensibly supervising a laser cutter when i'm working so that kind of focused design time is is curtailed. And I'm I'm quite keen to work with other designers as well who come up with ideas that feel like they're in our space. Not necessarily dexterity. I think we were talking about this at the expo that we don't want to be the guys who just make dexterity games. Mm-hmm. Um, but we there was something about the the visceral fun we observed people having that we kind of want to to capture that maybe in our games, but I'm not quite sure how we go about that yet but we've had we've had a few ideas floated away by other people that you know when we have a bit of brain time we we can work on refining and developing perhaps and see where we go mm-hmm. but yeah it's been a heck of a journey though oh it sounds <laughs> yeah. like it. yeah it's got <laughs> fires and, and everything <laughs> anything else you guys wanted to discuss or mention we've already mentioned that it's coming to game on the 4th of july and if, it, if any of the rest of it sounds appealing to anyone, then uh, our website is Eurydice Games, which is E-U-R-Y-D-I-C-E games.co.uk. You can get the base game and the first expansion off our website right now. And Paul will box them up in his garage and send them to you. Yeah. Handcrafted. And yes, if anyone's ever thinking of going that route for production, please get in touch with us and have a chat. I'm currently working with... We have with stories. A- we have stories. Um, and I'm, I'm currently helping another company design some acrylic laser cut tokens for their game, uh, which has been 
massively satisfying uh, and made me realize that you know as an old dog i have learned some new tricks <laughs> which is which is amazing i never thought 10 years ago i would i didn't know what a laser cutter was let alone i'd ever learn how to use one um so it's you know if anyone's interested in you know doing it themselves get in touch and we'll we'll, we'll see if we can help and advise great well thank you guys so much for coming on to talk about your journey i think this is fantastic i love when it's a game that's truly like you can tell it's something that people the designers and creators love uh and just want to get out there and i can see that with both of you it's it's really really cool and again i will have the link to the game found campaign going live on july 4th easy date to remember or at least if you're american (laughs) Yeah, we try to forget it as British people. <laughs> <laughs> Splitters Day. Splitters. <laughs> oh, man. Well, thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, as always, you can find everything I do at thethoughtfulgamer.com, and you can support me at patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. Uh, you can find me on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Are you guys on social media? You want to shout out your... Twitter's the best place to find me, Jackson underscore Pope. And yeah. I'm, well, my, I'm Paul Wilcox Ooh. 10 with yeah. two L's in Wilcox because it's an annoying way of spelling it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>